And so I look forward to taking that opportunity with you in the days to come. Uh, and but if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to spend a little bit of time there today. And as we have been over the last few weeks in our series on the Beatitudes, as you're finding your way there, let me just make just a couple of announcements. I don't know whether any of you all, I know a few of you did, you had the privilege to be with Miss Virginia Cowart yesterday. What a beautiful lady she is still at 100 years of age. My, 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 my. Her mind is just as sharp. My goodness, I sit down beside her and talk to her a good while and it was just amazing to see how God has preserved her and given her a good mind. And I, if you have not, did not get an opportunity to see her, I want to encourage you to continue to pray for her. She's with, living with her son up in Cummins, Georgia. But, uh, but anyway, uh, it was a great opportunity yesterday. This, uh, this weekend, this coming weekend, we'll, we'll be hosting both our men's ministry uh, for breakfast at 8 o'clock. Uh, opportunity to get together and pray together a bit, to have some fellowship together. And our ladies, the Inspire group, will also be meeting this coming week as well. And their theme this week is Come to the Light. And I've been encouraged to encourage you to simply bring a dish and prepare to come for a blessing. So uh, I hope you'll take an opportunity to share with our ladies at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning as well as our men. If you're men, uh, we'd love for you to come join us as well at 8 o'clock and we'll look forward to our time together as well. Anyway, if you have your Bibles this morning, I, I hope you have your, have your Bibles attached to Matthew chapter 5, and we'll be there in just a moment. But let me share a story, if I can, at the very outset of our time together today. It was in 1982 that the Los Angeles Times actually recorded a story about a lady by the name of Anna May Penica. She was 62 year old at the time, who had been blind from birth. At age 47, she married a man that she met in Braille class, and for the first 15 years of their marriage, he did the seeing for both of them until he completely lost his vision as a result of retinitis pigmentosa. Mrs. Pinnaca had never seen the green of spring, the blue of a winter sky, or, or the beauty of a sunset, yet because she had grown up in a loving, supported family, she never felt resentful because of the handicap that she had always had. In October of 1981, Dr. Thomas Pettit of the Jules Stein Institute of University of California at Los Angeles performed a surgery to remove the rare congenital uh, genital cataract from her, the lens of her left eye, and Mrs. Pinnaca for the very first time in life, saw. The newspaper account didn't record her first words, but it does tell us how she found that everything was almost bigger than life and brighter than she ever imagined. But it did tell us that she found that everything was, uh, uh, even her husband that she had known so well, sort of seemed as, he had, that she had, as, as she had imagined, but other acquaintances that she had known, not maybe not as well, were either taller or shorter, or heavier, or skinnier, skinnier than she had first pictured them. Since that day, Mrs. Pinnock had hardly been able to wait to wake up in the morning, splash her eyes with water, put on her glasses, and enjoy the changing morning light. Her vision became 20-30, enough, enough to pass a driving test. Think how wonderful it must have been for Anna Mae Pinnock when she looked for the very first time at the faces that she had only felt, or when she saw the kaleidoscope of a Pacific sunset or a tree waving its branches or a bird in flight. The gift of physical sight is wonderful, and the miracle of seeing for the first time, we can hardly describe that experience. Yet I want to say to us this morning, and this sort of brings us to our notes this morning, there's a seeing that surpasses even this first sight. There's a sight that surpasses the greatest sunset, the most elaborate view of nature, the most detailed work, work of man's artistry, and that is seeing God. Since nothing is higher than God, seeing God is logically the greatest joy 
that anyone will ever be able to experience. Thus, when we pass from this world and see the face of Christ, the joy of that first moment will transcend the accumulated joys and sights of an entire lifetime. Every other sight that was admired will quickly fade into comparison. You know, as I think about that story and I really think about the context of that, I'm reminded back of Exodus chapter 13. Remember Moses? Moses longed to be able to see God in his glory. He cried out to God. It was, it was need, as the story tells us in Exodus 13, as, they, as the tent of meeting actually gathered and Moses went in the tent of meeting as it had had on many occasions the cloud of God, the, 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 the gathering of the cloud of God's presence actually gathered over that tent and, and hovered over that tent. The, t- the te- text tells us that the, that the family stood in the doorways of their tent just to, just to ponder of the fact that Moses was there in the presence of Almighty God. In the midst of him having such a radiance of his presence, in the, in the sense of the scripture says that God talked with him as a man talks with his friend, even in that close proximity, Moses had one request of God. I want to see your glory. I want to see more of you. I want to be able to know you in a greater way than I've ever known you in the past. And the reality is I think that typifies maybe our desires as well as we walk in this journey of faith. Is We need and we long to be able to know God in a greater way. And we long to be able to see him face to face. Sometimes it is as we walk in this life, sometimes as we walk in these dark seasons of life, we really need God with skin on, right? I mean, reality, sometimes we just need somebody to be able to hug us and we long to have something more of God than many times we're able to experience on this side of eternity. The scripture teaches us regarding Matthew chapter 5 and helps us to be able to see that as we sort of walk into this next level of the Beatitudes. Jesus seeing the crowds there in chapter 5 verse 1, he went up on the mountain and when he had sat down with his disciples, they came to him. And he opened his mouth and began to teach them. And he began to teach them the Beatitudes. And he said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. We were there last week, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's where we'll be today. For they will see what? God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before me. As we think about this passage and the longing within our hearts, I believe to be able to see and know God in a deeper and greater way. I believe this passage particularly speaks to that end and I believe that Jesus gives us a little bit of insight of what that requires of us and so if we can for the next few moments I'd like for us to be able to outline this text if we can this way. First of all I think we need to understand something of what it means to have purity of heart. Purity of heart. What does it mean? What we do know about our heart is that our heart is not the most, it's not just this organ on the inside that pumps the blood, but when we understand biblically the heart, that heart is not a good place, right? Reality. Jeremiah said it this way in Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. In other words, it's incurable. It's wicked. And he would go on to say, who can understand it? The reality is sometimes that happens. You ever had those moments in your life when something you spoke and something just came out and you thought, where'd that come from? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you where it came from. It came from your heart. Scripture teaches that clearly. He says, "Out out out of the heart we speak. And so we need to understand that maybe sometimes in our lives when we sort of put, put down and maybe, maybe we can somehow or another conform our lives on the outside, sometimes we're introduced to our heart in ways that we really didn't know were there. And the scripture teaches us in, in this regarding Jeremiah 17, 9, and the message paraphrase says it this way, the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out, but I, God, 
search the heart, examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of all things. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. We do know, we recognize, we don't need anybody really to remind us of that. Our heart is deceitfully wicked. But the scripture says that our heart is, that if we're going to see God, we're going to have to learn or we're going to have to get to a place where we have a sense of purity of heart. And what does that look like? So if I can for this, I'd like to just sort of give us a, a brief sort of outline regarding that. What does that look like? I think, first of all, it's a heart that is clean. And that almost goes without saying. Purity has to do with cleanliness, and cleanliness is next to, well, that's not in the Bible either. But anyway, just thought I'd throw that in there. But a heart that's clean. Listen to what Psalm, the psalmist says. Listen to what David says in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Actually, what we need to know when we look at this passage of Scripture, we would, we would say that the cleanliness or this pure, pure issue, this pure word that we find in the original language is the word that comes from our word, or what the word we get to know, katharizo, that literally means to clean or to purify. In a physical sense, it's cleanliness or cleans, cleansing that's oftentimes described by the purity, purifying work of fire, where, where gold or silver or precious metals are put underneath the fire and the dross then rises to the top and is able to be skimmed away. In a, in a more moral sense, it's, it's, it's the avoidance of that which is forbidden. And in an ethical sense, it really has to do with that sense of blamelessness, innocence, unstained by the guilt of anything. If we would, would examine our lives today and we were to be honest with each other this morning, how many of us could honestly say we have a pure heart? None of us. Because we understand the stain that is present within every one of us. And yet Jesus says if we're going to sing God, we're going to have to have a pure, pure heart, a heart that's been purified, the purity of heart. Secondly, I need, we need to understand that it's a heart that's not only been clean, but a heart that's been cleansed by the only one who can cleanse our heart, and that's the Lord. A heart that's been cleansed by the Lord. The Old Testament talks about that the prophets particularly look forward to a time when God would ultimately give people clean hearts. Ezekiel writes these words, Ezekiel 36 verses 25 and 26, I will sprinkle clean water on you, God says, and you will be clean. I will cleanse your, you from your all impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Jeremiah would say similar words in this, as he would say in Jeremiah 31, 33, that God would put, would put the, his law into our minds and ultimately write his law upon our hearts. We need to understand as God does his work on the inside of us, so oftentimes we think about that which is pure is what we see on the outside. And it's so, so tempting for us and, the, and and there's not a wrong this not necessarily wrong for us to do that but it's so tempting for us to be able to get to the place that we want to purify or to show an outward sense of purity and yet inwardly never deal with the the, the heart of the matter and that really is a matter of the heart as Jesus addressed the issue to the Pharisees Jesus had come to a place where it was time to eat and he didn't wash his hands in the ceremonial, ceremonially clean, cleansing way. And as a result, he was rebuked by the Pharisees and Jesus responded to them this way, Matthew 23, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, and then outside you'll be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones and everything that's unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people, to the public as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And that's exactly what Jesus would say we talked about last week so oftentimes 
in this world, we want to look to a place where we live a life that's honorable and pleasing to God. We want to look, look good before everybody else. And he, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. So we come to a place that not only our heart needs to be cleansed, but we need to understand that you and I cannot cleanse our own heart. It's only God can do, who can do that. Let me say thirdly, we need to also understand that this heart that's cleansed is ultimately a heart that's in relationship with the Lord. It really begins with a relationship. It begins with a place where, where Nicodemus King, you, you must be born again. He understood that and he leaned in and, 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 and ultimately out of the context of Nicodemus, God would use that, that great story to remind us that, that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it begins with a relationship. And that relationship, first of all, understands that we cannot get there on our own. Purity is not something that we're going to be able to accomplish. William Barclay said it this way. It's, this purity is used to describe water that's absolutely clean, metals without any sense of alloy, sometimes grain that has been winnowed, and ultimately time he's talking about feelings that are unmixed, free from any taint of evil. It begins with a relationship with the Lord. In context, that's what happens. It begins there, and it lastly brings us to a place where that it's divide, it helps us to understand that it's a heart that ultimately that is undivided. A heart that's undivided. We often talk about integrity as being the same all the way around. Not, 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 not someone different on the inside and someone different on the outside. Not someone different on Sunday and someone different on Monday. The reality is it's talking about a mind and a heart that's undivided. That's, that's literally at, 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 at one before God. James chapter 4 verse 8 says it this way. Purify your hearts you double-minded. The psalmist said it this way. Psalm 86 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And in Jeremiah 32, verse 36, says, I will give them one heart and one way. A place where we come during our life where we find ourselves focused to come before God, recognizing who he is in singleness of mind, and singleness of sincerity, singleness of focus, singleness of concentration, singleness of, of heart and mind to be able to serve and live out our, our life and our faith before the living God. But the reality is, with the best efforts that we make in our life, with everything that we do, at the end of the day, our hearts are still dirty. It's still, it's still uh, wicked, vile, sick. We have to find our way in this life, this journey of life, as God searches our hearts to be able to allow God to be in, begin doing the cleansing in, in our life and the healing of our life and our hearts especially when we find ourselves, as James talks about this dividedness that we find in Scripture, how it lives out so many times in our personal life and our personal struggle. James says it this way in James chapter 3 as he's talking about the tongue. He talks about every, you know, we put rudders on a, on a ship to be able to guide a ship and we put br bridles in a, in a horse's mouth to guide the horse. But every kind of beast, verse 7, and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, but no man can tame the tongue. Why? It's a, it's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. And the reason, reality is, is that we, we can see and we can see the reflection of the heart on the inside of humanity because he said in verse 9, for with the tongue we bless our Lord. We, we're, one moment we're celebrating and worshiping the living God and in the next moment we use our that same tongue to curse people that are made in the likeness of God. We're beginning to see something of the depravity of the heart of humanity. We, we think on the one moment that we're, we're centered in Christ and on the next moment our hearts are divided and sometimes we find ourselves sometimes living out the divided lifestyle, a divided heart that is not centered fully into following after God. With the same mouth comes blessing and cursing and he goes on to say, can a salt pond yield fresh water? No. The problem within all of us is not, not what we're seeking and longing to do on the outside. The problem within every one of us is our hearts are 
desperately wicked. And apart from God at work in our lives, we'll never become who we need to become. The second thing I want us to understand something is the depth of purity. It's not just skin deep. You know, I, I remember growing up in, in, uh, in North Carolina, and sometimes we would hear the older folks in North Carolina speak about uh, beauty. It's, it's skin deep, right? Maybe that happened in some other parts of North Carolina. But the reality is sometimes it's not just on the surface. God's seeking to do something within us that only God can do to the depths of our being and to deal with that which is wretched and some, that which is wicked on the inside. Jesus was asked by the teacher, by, by the, by the uh, uh, Pharisee, what's the greatest commandment? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your... There's something about this synthesis of everything that we are. And so many times I, I, I wonder if we find ourselves in this journey of life that we segment ourselves up and we sort of put this Sunday kind of idea in our life and we sort of live out faith on Sunday, but on Monday our lives are different. I wonder sometimes if in relationship we find a group of people that we can honestly do relationship as we need to, but with another group of people we, we, we sort of shun or, or put them off to the side because we're not there in relationship with them. I wonder sometimes if we find ourselves having this depth of purity, being more on the outside, the external parts of our being, rather than rally, re, allowing the Word of God to go into the depths of our being to the places where the only the Word of God can actually do its best work and that could be said for all of us Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things Matthew 5 15 says for out of the heart comes evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality theft false testimony slander Mark 7 says nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of the man, outside of a man from within that makes him unclean. For from within, out of the man's heart comes evil thoughts. The Beatitudes talk to us and address matters that are really beyond our reach, beyond our ability to perfect. And yet Jesus calls us at the end of Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He's called us to a level that we cannot accomplish ourselves. He's called us to a place that is beyond our ability to be able to comprehend. But Jesus said, with the grace I'm demanding of you, it's the grace I'm also choosing to give to you. There's a depth of purity that we need to understand. And can I just call your attention once more to the promise that's given for those who are of pure heart? For they shall see God. You know, the beauty of this story is we oftentimes look, you know, Helen Keller was once asked this question, isn't it terrible to be blind? And she responded this way, I find it better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two eyes and see nothing. I'm really convinced today that God desires for you, as he did for Moses, for us to walk so in tune with God that while we may yet long to see more of him than we see currently, we still have a personal walk with God that is real and vibrant and, let me say, transformational. So much so that I believe when we look at this beatitude and see what God does in our heart, what only God can do to cleanse that wicked and vile heart, God gives us the promise that we then can see God. Is it just in eternity? Let me say, if I can, two or three things regarding that. First of all, I believe the implications of this passage has to do with seeing God now. Pastor, what do you mean by that? You know, I, I've all times looked back at my journey of faith. And I've looked back at those times that I've read through the, through the Bible. And, I, you, and you may have been here along the way as well, that you've read something. Maybe you've read a story. Maybe you've read a passage hundreds of times and then all of a sudden this one time 
It's like the words jump off the page into your lap. How did that happen? Well, obviously, we would say that it was because that you needed it at that moment. It was applicable for your current situation. But I would argue that it's because that you're growing in your faith in Christ so much so that the Word is becoming more alive in your life. You know, it's amazing when we look at our journey of faith, the psalmist records it this way in Psalm 29. David records it. He says this, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. And he's, he's talking about nature. And I, and I imagine for someone who's never met Christ as their personal Savior, you could look out over one of our Florida sunsets. I've never seen sunsets anywhere in, except in Florida, just as beautiful as we have. God p- p- paints a portrait for us that is wonderfully unique. But I can imagine a, someone who's never met Christ as their Savior would look at a sunset and be encouraged by the beauty that shines in the star or in the sky. But how many times have we as followers of Christ, maybe in one of those dark and dismal moments of our lives, lives looked out and seen a sunset, and it was almost as if God had painted that for me. He met me in the moment. There's a sense, I believe, in, as God walks in this journey of life and he seeks to call us to walk, he, he would remind us that God, our, our encounter of God, that we have an opportunity to be able to see and encounter uh, the presence of Almighty God currently. Job said it this way in Job, Job 42, 5. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. In grief and sorrow, in my darkest moment of life, I have seen the living God. But I don't think the passage intends for it to be there. Stopped. I think it's, all, it's about also seeing more of God as we move through this journey of life. I think the purer our hearts become, the more we will see God on, in this life. The more our hearts are focused upon him, absorbed with him, concentrated on his being, freed from our distractions, sincere. Strangely how just looking at Christ, somehow or another, that the that the troubles of this life go, grows dim. Seeing God in this life, the highest good, the greatest good, somehow or another brings us to the place that we grow up in him. And in growing up in him, we are, we're being transformed, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We're being transformed into his likeness. And as we grow in him, we're able to, 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 cap, to capture more of his presence and more of his glory, even as we walk through this journey of life we grow and long as Paul as Moses did to know more of him but I do believe that the scripture implies a time where we not just know him now maybe we see more of him as we grow in our journey of life but I believe he is talking specifically about seeing God fully one day that when our hearts are ultimately purified to its end, when we are find, when we're positioned into a body that's now being glorified, we had the privilege last week to be able to, to share about Miss Cherry Jordan. And how many times, if, if you've known her, walked with her, you've heard her talk about her Jesus, you've heard her talk about going home, and she, she longed for that place after Bill died. She longed for it more than she ever had in the, pre, in, the, in, in the previous time I've ever known her. But the reality was to what she has only seen by faith, today she sees by sight. She has fully seen what God has prepared for her that which eyes have not seen nor ears heard or even entered the heart of man for but that God has prepared for those who love him God has provided her the opportunity to be able to see as Job said in Job 19 I know my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed yet in my flesh I will see God I'll see him with my own eyes And my heart yearns for that day. You know, the irony of Miss Pinnacle's miracle, according to Dr. Pettit, he says that the surgical procedures that he performed on her in 1981 
were available as far back as into the 40s when she was a child. Mrs. Pinnaca lived 40 plus of her 62, light, 62 sightless years unnecessarily blind. And we know today that the technique, quote unquote, for addressing spiritual blindness has existed for at least 2,000 years. The procedure's radical and it's 100% effective because God is the physician. You simply must be born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh, Jesus said to Nicodemus. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised, he went on to say, that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit in our lives, we cannot explain it. It's deeper and, and greater than we can ever explain with our life, but it is absolutely true, and it's transformational if we just by faith come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me mention to you, if I can, just two or three things in application. If we're going to, as followers of Christ, see God, I think, one, we've got to be honest, absolutely honest, with God about our heart's condition. We, our heart is desperately wicked. And you and I, with the best of our work in this life, cannot fix what is eternally broken. Only God can do that. There's no need for us to try to hide that from the Lord. Why don't we just simply be honest? He already knows what's in our hearts. He already knows what's there. Let's just be honest about our heart's condition. Secondly, we need to acknowledge that only God can make your heart pure. You can't do it with your best effort. You can't fix your life. You can only be air, as it were. You can only be pharisaical in that regard. You can only be able to look good for the people around you. (laughs) Only God can change the heart. And yet we do have a responsibility in this journey. Philippians 2 says, Therefore, my brothers, as you've already obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. We need to acknowledge that it's God at work in our lives to make our lives pure. Thirdly, We need to fill our lives with the only thing that's transformational, and that's the Word of God. The Scripture teaches us that the Word of God is quick or alive, sharp, and sharper than any two-edged sword, divides asunder the the joints and the marrow, and and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. Only God can, only God's Word can actually get down to the depths of our being that we can discern even how wicked and how vile our heart is so that we might be able to take, take matters into and allow God to take matters into his hands to surrender that to the Lord so that he might do the trans- transformational work that only he can do. And God is about changing our lives from the inside out. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. And lastly... For a couple of reasons, as I walk through this journey, the longer I walk this planet, the more I understand how critical it is for me and I believe all of us to keep our eyes focused on what we will become in eternity. You know, we're not there yet. I'm grateful the longer I am walking this planet, the more grateful I am that God doesn't make it easy. Wouldn't it be sad to be satisfied to live here for all eternity. But I believe God allows us to have difficulties in this life to remind us that there's a place that's better than we ever, that we've ever envisioned. That there's a sight that's greater than the greatest sunset. That there's, a, there's, there's something beyond that eyes have not seen, has never entered in our hearts. We've never even thought about such good things that God has prepared for those of us who love him. And I believe that's why God keeps us trouble filled and humbled so that we might be willing to be transformed you know sadly enough in our lives so many times we know 
within things that need to be fixed, resolved, addressed. And for whatever reason we choose to sort of skirt on by, push it aside, move on without dealing with it. And yet in reality, God invites us as followers of Christ to do business, to allow God to do what only God can do, to address the matters of the heart that's dark, that's dismal, that's broken. I wonder today what God is seeking to do in our hearts as he seeks to purify us and ready us to see him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we bless you today and we thank you so much for your love and your grace, for the opportunity we have today to be able to live out our faith in such a way that God would uh, give us the privilege to be able to, to, um, to see you. And I just pray, God, in the journey of life that you'd allow us the opportunity to be able to have the courage to be able to address the matters of our heart that need to be resolved, that we need to surrender to you, that we need to allow you to do what only you can do in cleansing our hearts. So God, today we seek to do that. Search our hearts and know us. Help us that we might be able to see within what we may not see naturally, but through your spirit you show us what areas that need to be addressed. Search us and know us. And if there's any deceptive way within us, I pray, God, today that you might help us to be able to see that. And not just see it, but grant to us the courage to be able to surrender it to you, to repent from it, and allow then you to bring about the cleansing and the purification that only God can do. Use this time to draw us to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand?